Welcome back to the Religions of the Ancient Mediterranean podcast. My name is Phil Harland. I'm a professor at York University in Toronto. And in this series of the podcast, we're looking at Paul and his communities. We're looking at the earliest Christian communities that we know anything about. In this podcast, we're looking at the history of early Christianity from a historical perspective rather than a theological one. And this goes for how we approach Paul as well. In the previous episode, we looked at Paul's biographical information and began to get a sense of who this Paul was. Now we move on to the actual letters that Paul wrote. This is the first of two episodes that concentrate on Christians at Thessalonica in Macedonia, north of Greece. Episode two considers the situation faced by these Christians in the mid first century CE. Episode three will be considering Paul's response to the situation that these Christians were facing. First Thessalonians itself, this letter that Paul wrote to the Christians at Thessalonica, is very important precisely because it is our earliest evidence for Christianity at all. So enjoy finding out some more about the earliest Christians living in the Roman Empire. Last week's discussion, we were introducing Paul and introducing the question, how can we approach the study of Paul? The main proposal I made to you would be that we integrate social historical, rhetorical, epistolary approaches and take all of these methods together. And I developed what I called the situation and response method. So you have that series of questions regarding the situation at a particular locale and then a series of questions regarding how Paul responds to it. This is the perfect sort of approach to a letter because they're situational. They're real letters, Paul's letters, written to real people. We'll also do, be doing comparison. Once we get into more and more letters, we'll be able to look back and say, okay, now that we know how Paul relates to the Christians at Thessalonica, and now we know what was going on at Thessalonica, how does that compare to what is going on among the Christians in, in Corinth and, and Paul's response to them? What sort of nuances are there? How do we compare these things? Is Christianity the same at every locale, etc.? Does Paul respond similarly everywhere, or does he have a different sort of tack on things, depending on who he's writing to? There's a couple things that I'll be making as my central points today, and really they'll be continuing points throughout the whole discussion of Paul. On the one hand, in a letter like 1 Thessalonians, we have a clear insight into the complexity of this figure, Paul. And by complexity, I mean the fact that he's a Judean, who writes in Greek, who is trained in Greco-Roman rhetoric, and who also, in many ways, can be understood as a figure in the context of intellectual life in the Greco-Roman world. So there's a mixture of cultural backgrounds that we've already referred to in Paul that already come to the fore in 1 Thessalonians. And so we can use this as an avenue into insights into Paul, the figure, and his cultural context and and the ways in which the way he thinks reflect his Judean background and his Greco-Roman background. So we'll already get into that today. But the second main thing I hope you get out of today's lecture, and it'll also be continuing, is the fact that uh, Christianity is diverse. And And there's a sense in which Thessalonica is not necessarily representative of what is going on in Christian communities and other locales, even within the Pauline brand of Christianity. There's differences from one place to the next. So that's sort of looking ahead to the fact that Thessalonica is not representative. There may be aspects of what's going on among the followers of Jesus at Thessalonica that do get repeated, so to speak, in other Christian groups, but we can't assume that's the case. Thessalonica is a key city And it ultimately becomes the capital, the official center for this whole province of Macedonia. In other words, north north of Greece. We're going to come across another Christian group that Paul founded that's also in this province of Macedonia, Philippi, relatively close to Thessalonica. Next week, because we're working chronologically through the letters, we're going down to Greece and to Corinth down here. So all of our discussion today and next week, and also in future weeks sometimes, will be in this general area of Greece and Macedonia, uh, an important area for where Paul obviously founded communities. 
there's a sense in which the cultural life that you would encounter in a Greek city like Thessalonica is somewhat typical of just about every other Greek city. And by typical, I mean there's a variety of things going on, some of which are unique to that city. So it's typical in being unique. It's, it's typical in the sense that each Greek city had a variety of gods worshipped, and sometimes there would be aspects of which gods that are honored, and the way that they're honored, that would be different from another Greek city. So we have evidence of Egyptian deities being worshipped there. That's typical of other Greek cities, imported foreign deities being worshipped. We have evidence of Zeus being worshipped, Dionysus being worshipped, a similar range to what you would find in Ephesus and other cities like the ones we watched the slides on, where you began to get a sense of the variety of gods that were worshipped. Let's look at, first of all, the question when we go to Paul, uh, the question of the history of Paul's relationship with people at Thessalonica. This is a useful question to ask no matter what letter you're looking at. Because they're letters, because they're situational, it's a good thing to know, okay, what happened before this letter was written? As well, you go into detail about what can we know from the letter about what was happening just before the letter was written, yes. But you also need to ask the question, okay, when did Paul go to Thessalonica? After he went there for the very first time, did he have any communication with them? Did he write any letters to them before the letter we're looking at? So this question of the history of Paul's relationship with a particular community is an important one to ask because often it reveals a lot about what you need to know in order to understand the letter. Because letters are always one-sided conversations, aren't they? We're just getting Paul's side of a conversation with people. In an ongoing way, reading the passages in Acts of the Apostles that relate to the different cities that are referenced in Paul's letters. However, we need to be careful about how we use Acts of the Apostles. We can't use it as a a, a, our first source for understanding Paul or what happened. We need to look at his own first letter. Let me point to you to some key evidence on this. First of all, he went there in the first place, right? There's evidence in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians that Paul himself had gone there and had taught them something. Paul has this one sentence in which he summarizes what seems to be the central message he taught when he went to Thessalonica and probably the central message he taught when he first went to any of these other locales. 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter, verses 9 and 10. So Paul opens his letter in a typical Greek letter style, saying who he is and who he's writing to. He then gives thanks and mentions prayers to the gods, God in this case, right? Just like you would expect in any Greek letter. He then starts praying talking about his positive relationship with the Thessalonians and how wonderful they are and how he wants to say how they're good examples to everyone else. Then in the midst of this sort of context, Paul incidentally summarizes in one statement what he is praising about them, namely that they've accepted his main message. And this is what it is. Take a look at verses 9 and 10. For they themselves, followers of Jesus in the rest of Macedonia and Achaia, They themselves report concerning us what a welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols. Paul teaches Jewish monotheism. When he goes to a Greek city and manages to get a few people to listen to him, Gentiles in this case, we'll soon see, he teaches that they need to turn to God from idols. The message is, turn from worshipping your Greek and Roman gods to worshipping this Jewish God. That's the main message he gives when Paul goes to cities of the Mediterranean world. Look at this next little element that is also central to what he teaches. And to wait for his son from heaven. He teaches that that one Jewish God had a son and that that son is somewhere else where God is. People who are supposed to adopt the worship of the Jewish God and who are supposed to believe that that Jewish God has a son are supposed to wait for that son. Paul also says more about this son, right? Whom he raised from the dead. Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. So, worship the Jewish God. That Jewish God has one son that is going to come from heaven. That son had previously been raised from the dead by God, according to Paul. And that same son is identified for you right here, Jesus. And that son is supposed to deliver the people who worship the Jewish God from some sort of wrath. This is a very clear apocalyptic statement here, telling you 
that Paul is an apocalyptic Judean. Not all Jews were apocalyptic, but he is one of them. So there you have it. That seems to be what Paul first taught when he first went through Thessalonica on his first occasion for passing through. In this case, but not in all cases, of communities Paul founds, he's actually quite proud of what happens after he leaves in terms of the people continuing to, to think along the lines of what Paul wants them to think. There's a little bit more evidence of what has happened before Paul wrote this letter, though. In chapter 3, he incidentally mentions something else that has happened before he's written this letter. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. So he's talking about some of his later journeys. After he's been in Thessalonica, he's in Athens, down in Greece. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's servant in the good news of Christ, to establish you in your faith and to exhort you, that no one be moved by these afflictions. So Timothy is a partner of Paul. And after Paul has gone through on his first visit and traveled down into Greece and now is in Athens, he's worried about the Christians at Thessalonica in some way, and he sends his pal Timothy to go and find out how things are going. This seems to be the main source of the information Paul uses to write this letter. Otherwise, how would he know what was going on in Thessalonica after he's left? Paul writes and addresses those difficulties and tries to, what he sees as, help the Christians at Thessalonica through those difficulties. That's the bare bones of what we know about the history of Paul's relationship with the Christians at Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians is our earliest evidence for Christianity at all. Most scholars date it to the early 50s, but this is the first glimpse we get of anything to do with this Jesus movement. Before we get into the situation more fully, the situation among the Christians that are at Thessalonica, I want to say something about the problem of reconstructing such a situation. There are difficulties in doing this, in trying to reconstruct the situation that led Paul to write a letter. Because all we've got are Paul's letters. There's a bit of circular activity going on here. And using the letter in order to reconstruct the situation and then using the letter in order to find out the response to, to the situation, right? So we need to remain attentive to that difficulty. But it's the only thing we've got. So we're only hearing one side of a conversation, is something I mentioned today. A letter is a conversation you would have talked to the people, but instead you write from a distance. And we're only having that one side of the conversation. It makes it difficult to reconstruct the other side of the conversation. Remaining aware of those difficulties, we can nonetheless try our hardest to see what we can know about the situation within a, a group of Jesus followers like at Thess- Thessalonica. First of all, the composition of the followers of Jesus at Thessalonica. There's two different issues that you can concentrate on when you're asking who are these Christians? Who are these followers of Jesus at a particular locale? One factor is their ethnic status. Who are they ethnically speaking? The other is their social or economic status. Who are they on the social ladder of the Roman Empire? These two questions are useful to ask in, with, for each of the different communities we'll look at. And we'll get different answers. And we'll begin to see the social profile and the ethnic profile of the earliest Christian groups by asking those questions. The common old theory is wrong. And that old theory is that all of early Christianity was a lower class movement. Instead, what we'll begin to see, and today we'll just start with Thessalonica and see what's going on there, but when we get to the variety of different places, we'll begin to see a spectrum of possibilities in the social makeup and the ethnic makeup of followers of Jesus in different locales. From what I've said so far, there's already an indicator of their ethnic status, at least a general one. Not that we know whether they're formerly from Syria or whether they're formerly from Corinth, and now they're settled. We don't know the details of their ethnic background. But we know something generally about them. Are they Judeans or are they not Judeans? What have we said so far already today in my discussion that might indicate to you, or from your reading of 1 Thessalonians, they would point to what ethnic identity they are. Are they Judeans, Jews, or are they non-Judeans? They're most likely non-Judeans. Most likely what Judeans call Gentiles, right? Greeks, in this case, in Thessalonica. Steph was saying that we have them turning to God from idols. 
Do Judeans need to turn away from idols to the Jewish God? No. And this is his general characterization of the whole group. There are other hints in the letter that give you even further confirmation of this, especially when Paul is giving his moral exhortation. Remember that word paranesis? I said you'll find paranesis as a typical sort of material in each of Paul's letters. Well, you have it in his first letter to the Christians at Thessalonica, where he has an extensive set of teachings on how to morally behave yourselves. And it's in chapter 4 on how people are to behave. Turns out, in this case, Paul's saying, you're doing great, but keep doing it. But it all sounds like moral exhortation to non-Judeans, because a Judean in the first century assumes Gentiles are sexual perverts who are up to all kinds of crazy stuff. It's a bit of uh, ethnic profiling that Judeans do about non-Judeans in antiquity. It's not that every single Judean's nasty. We're not saying that. That's the last thing in the world we're saying. But it's a common thing to encounter in Judean literature, this overall stereotype of non-Judeans. And so the moral exhortation in 1 Thessalonians fits with Christians at Thessalonica being Gentiles. Finally, brethren, I'm in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. We beseech you and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, as you learned from us, how you ought to live and to please God, just as you are doing. So he's, he's saying you're doing it. You, you, you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. So he's now going to hearken back to things he taught them, which will tell you that they are Gentiles, because you wouldn't need to emphasize these things if you were talking to Judeans. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from unchastity, from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to take a wife for himself in holiness and honor, not in passion of lust like the pagans who do not know God. The point here we're taking is confirmation that these are Gentiles. We can also ask the question of who they are socially and economically within the society of Thessalonica. Sometimes in Paul's letters, we have evidence to get hints of this. And we're lucky with Thessalonians because it's one of the ones that we can do this. Does anyone know from reading 1 Thessalonians, did you notice any information you encountered that would give you an inclination as to what the social status or economic status of the Christians at Thessalonica are primarily? Working class. And what sort of thing leads you to that idea that they may be working class people? So we have several references in Paul's letters to Paul engaging in work with his hands alongside of the Christians at Thessalonica. Well, there's only one reference to that, the way I just phrased it. But there are other confirmations that this is uh, the situation, that most of the Christians at Thessalonica are hand workers, are craftsmen of some sort. Things like chapter 2 of uh, Paul's first letter to the Christians at Thessalonica. Chapter 2, verses 9 to 10 especially, is, is a key passage. Look what Paul says to them when he's writing. For you remember our labor and toil, brothers. We worked night and day that we might not be any burden to you while we preached to you the gospel of God. So in this phrase, we have Paul referring to the fact of working in order to actually raise money so that he wouldn't need to burden the Thessalonian Christians. In other words, that the Christians at Thessalonica wouldn't have to financially support Paul in his activities. And Paul, we'll see, continues on this idea of self-support and working with his own hands. And we've got to place that within a broader context in the Greco-Roman world, and we will soon. What we're pointing out now is this idea of working with his hands, which he's telling us, to support himself financially. But look at the phrasing. While we preach to you the good message of God. It almost sounds like, and this is what some scholars have really pointed out recently, and only in recent decades, it sounds like Paul is in the workshop teaching some non-Judeans about the Jewish God and about the son the Jewish God has and that you need to wait for that son, and that there's a wrath to come. All those things we had in that opening chapter. That's going on in the workshop setting, it seems. Or maybe in a, in a section of the city where there's a series of workshops where craftsmen sell their wares, and where craftsmen are creating their wares. And that this is the setting in which he's encountering non-Judeans in Thessalonica and teaching them these things. 
And it turns out, therefore, that at Thessalonica, but this isn't the case at every place he goes, that the Christians are primarily of the lower working classes. Something to mention to you is the disdain that upper class people, that wealthier people have for people that work with their hands in antiquity. Basically, handwork is considered slavery by the upper classes. Upper class people would look down upon hand workers. And Paul himself is engaging in hand work, even though he's an intellectual. There's a weird combination. We've got to figure that out soon enough. But let me give you a quote from Cicero, who's from the first century BCE, but you could get similar quotes from all kinds of upper class authors uh, that would be along these lines. Here's Cicero talking about what occupation wealthier people should have. And he says this, Now in regard to trades and other means of livelihood, which ones are to be considered becoming to a gentleman? And which ones are vulgar? Vulgar are the means of livelihood of all hired workmen, whom we pay for mere manual labor, not for artistic skill. For in their case, the very wage they receive is a pledge of their slavery. And all mechanics, all people that work with their hands, are engaged in vulgar trades. For no workshop can have anything free or liberal about it. Least respectable of all are all those trades which cater for sensual pleasures. Fishmongers, fish dealers, butchers, cooks and poulterers, and fishermen. As Terence says, But of all the occupations by which gain is secured, none is better than agriculture. None more profitable, none more delightful, none more becoming to a free man. What does, what does Cicero mean by agriculture? Does he mean... Oh, it's not good to be in a workshop, but it's fine to go work with your hands in the fields. No, he's not talking about that. The gentleman is to own land that other people work for him. This is the most common perception you'll see among intellectuals and writers in antiquity about occupations and how to look at them. The upper class people are supposed to own land and let other people work it. There are some oddballs among intellectuals that go against the grain. Paul is one of them. Another guy named Musonius Rufus, a philosopher, a Stoic philosopher, may be another one from the first century. So there are people going against the grain. Now that we've got a basic profile of them being non-Judeans and being hand workers, of being craftsmen, let's say a few more things about Paul as a hand worker. Slight tangent here. We're mostly talking about the situation at Thessalonica and what's going on. I just want to go on a little tangent here about the identity of Paul while we're on the topic of handwork. As you've learned from what I've already said, the upper classes look down upon handwork. And so, Paul's engaging in a craft, perhaps even the craft of making tents, we're not positive, because the only place it's referred to explicitly what his occupation is, is in Acts of the Apostles, where it says he's a tent maker. So that's a good candidate, because the way Paul talks about it is that he's a manual laborer. But people would look down upon that. The uh, Most intellectuals and most upper-class people would look down upon that choice he made. It's obviously a choice if you're an intellectual and you're engaging in manual labor. If you're high enough status to be highly educated and know how to read and write, then it's a bit of an odd thing to choose to be working with your hands. If you know your Greco-Roman rhetoric and can write sophisticated rhetoric, it's a bit odd for you to choose to work with your hands. So let's try and place this aspect of Paul within a broader context briefly here. Namely, how does he support himself financially in his activities? And it seems to be his main choice is working with his hands. There are some times, we'll see later, that he does accept money from others. And sometimes where he rejects money from the people he's teaching. This idea of choosing handwork as your occupation and engaging in intellectual life does have some parallels. So there are examples in antiquity of this being the case. The first one from the pseudo-Socratic epistles illustrates debates that were going on among philosophers contemporary with Paul. In other words, there were Greek and Roman philosophers around the time of Paul that were debating what is the most appropriate form of financially supporting yourselves while also engaging in the philosophical life, the intellectual philosophical life if you're a Stoic, if you're a, a Cynic, what is the appropriate means of supporting yourself? Where should you get your money from and food from? This was a debate among philosophers, 
And precisely some of the issues we've already raised are part of the debate. Some philosophers are saying, I'm no lower class, vulgar hand worker. The ultimate way to support yourself in the philosophical life, say the Epicureans, like Philodemus, is to live the leisurely life. Definitely not working with your hands. Instead, freeing up your entire life in leisure to pursue the proper philosophical life. The quote from Philodemus is that it's best to live off the manual labor of others. Quote, For then one is least entangled in business, the source of so many annoyances. There indeed is found a becoming way of life, a withdrawal into leisure with one's friends, and for those who moderate their desires, the most honorable source of revenue. Sit back and relax and let other people work for you. We're sort of having the Cicero perspective here, aren't we? The typical upper class perspective being reflected in these, among these philosophers, Epicureans. However, in the other quote that I've given you here, it gives you an example of someone who's doing something similar to what Paul does. In this case, we're talking about cynics, cynic philosophers. And the pseudo-Socratic epistles are written in the 2nd century CE, but they reflect material from earlier times and debates from earlier times. And here there's talk of a guy, a cynic of the past, known as Simon the Shoemaker. He's a cynic philosopher, and he's a shoemaker. And it praises Simon the Shoemaker, this particular writing. So obviously it's on that side of the debate among philosophers, saying that the best way to support yourself financially is by working with your own hands. And the point they always stress is being self-sufficient. Paul stresses this too. The idea of working with your own hands so that you're not dependent on people and so that you don't have to answer to anyone. Self-sufficient, they don't have to tell you how to teach because they're not giving you money, you don't have to answer to them. This seems to be the main idea behind working with your own hands among the philosophers who who mention it, self-sufficiency. And here it says, praises Simon the Shoemaker since he continues to devote himself to the teachings of Socrates and uses neither his poverty nor his trade as a pretext for not doing philosophy, as certain others do who do not want to understand fully or to admire Socrates' teachings and their contents. So it's part of an ongoing debate among Greek philosophers, Greek and Roman philosophers. So in a sense, Paul's uh, issue of how to support himself financially and the answer he gives, I'm going to work with my own hands and be self-sufficient. Sometimes he does accept money, by the way, but we'll see where that is later. It's a Greek side of Paul, so to speak. This issue that he's dealing with on on support and financial support. But as we get into other letters of Paul, and clearly in 1 Thessalonians, we'll also notice that it's at the heart of Paul's identity as well, this issue of economics. The issue of finances and how he financially supports himself isn't just a side issue that once in a while he thinks about it. No, it's at the heart of what's going on here an aspect that people in the past that were more focused on ideas when they were studying Paul, they were more focused on theology, were more focused on ideology when they were studying Paul's letters, tended to ignore issues like this that are important for understanding the figure of Paul. And so this whole cultural realm of philosophical activity is very helpful for understanding Paul. Not that he's a cynic philosopher, but that understanding that broader cultural sphere is a way of understanding Paul better and under placing him within the Greco-Roman world. So at least so far we have a sense of who the Christians at Thessalonica are. We have a sense of Paul's identification with them, which is important, in the sense that he's a hand worker and they're a hand worker. Let's talk about some of the issues that were going on with the, among the Christians at Thessalonica that Paul heard about through Timothy. Paul had been there, he sent Timothy, Timothy came back, with information from the Christians at Thessalonica. And some of that information relates to these two main factors I want to point out to you today. One is afflictions. My translation gives me afflictions. Mine's the New Revised Standard Version, but could someone turn to chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians if you have the New Revised Standard Version? Chapter 3, verse 3. That no one be moved by these afflictions is what I have in my translation. What do you guys have in yours? Persecutions. Okay, actually afflictions is a little better than persecutions because persecutions already makes you think of things that may not be going on. But anyways, these references to persecutions or afflictions are scattered at various places throughout 
the letter to the Christians at Thessalonica. And it seems that this is the, one of the main issues that Paul had that led him to write the letter. Namely, that the Christians were faced with afflictions. And there's one passage that unpacks it a tiny bit. Enough that we can begin to know what it is. And it's going to be something familiar to you. Take a look at chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. There's several other places where afflictions and suffering or persecutions are mentioned in 1 Thessalonians. But this is one of the key ones that allows us to say, what were they? For you, brothers, became imitators of the assemblies of God in Christ Jesus, which are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen, from Thessalonians, as they did from Judeans. So he's comparing the followers of Jesus at Thessalonica to the followers of Jesus in Judea. And he's saying some of the Judeans made the Judean followers of Jesus suffer in the same way that some of the Thessalonicans here in Thessalonic, there in Thessalonica are making you suffer. The sort of afflictions you're facing in Thessalonica are similar to what the followers of Jesus in Judea faced. So it seems to be persecution of some sort. So persecution is somewhat accurate, but don't blow it up into what we now know is not the way persecution was. Persecution is not systematic from top down and 